Hello guys, in this clip, Howard Max will discuss 1. What is the most important thing to do as a young investor? 2. What is the biggest screw up an investor can do to his own portfolio? 3. Why it is important not to get in the way of compounding interest? 4. Why starting investing early is so important? 5. Why index fund could be the best strategy for most investors? 6. Why it is important to keep in mind that there is no short thing? 7. How most people lose a lot of amount of money. 8. Why the Fed may be playing a dangerous game. And 9. Why you should not let macro conditions influence your investment strategy. Enjoy this amazing advice. The most important thing is to start an investment program while you're young continue it as you grow and don't screw it up that's my that's my most important recommendation how do you screw it up you tamper with it too much and of course as i mentioned some time ago the biggest screw up you can do is to sell out at the bottom and so most people are not really suited for getting in and out of the market. And I, 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 I said that I think that it's, if that's how you're going to practice defense, it's very problematic. If you look at the stock market, the stock market has returned about 10% a year for the last 90 years. And uh, if, you, if you can make 10% a year, and if you can avoid paying any taxes, so don't sell. Your money will double every seven years. Money compounds at 10% a year. It doubles in seven years. So let's say your grandchildren are five. And they're going to they're gonna live to, to, uh, to 75. You've got a 70-year program ahead of them. That means if you can do 10% a year and not pay taxes, both of which are his heroic assumptions, but it's going to double 10 times. So you put in a dollar today, the kid is five, right? Uh, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1,024. A dollar deposited when the kid is five will be a thousand dollars. 70 years from now. Just don't screw that up. Don't get in the way of, of, of a compounding machine. You know, uh, I think it was Mark Twain, maybe the, um, Albert Einstein, uh, Einstein said, the greatest invention in history is compound interest. Just get out of the way. Don't screw it up. So, so I think that, uh, and by the way, my grandchildren, should probably be at about 95 or 100 on my risk return dial from zero to 100. Why? Because they have their whole lives ahead of them and their parents and their grandpa is probably going to backstop them anyway. So they, they, should, they should invest early. Probably all in the stock market. You don't have to get fancy you know, with, with, with other things. They, and, and so uh, that, with, and by the way, that means index funds, really. An S&P index fund, a Russell 2000 index fund. You know, you want to you get a, maybe an a, a emerging market fund. Uh, you, wanna, you might want to have some exposure to the emerging markets, to smaller companies, certainly to China, which is probably going to be, look, before those grandchildren become adults, China will be the biggest economy in the world. So you want to have exposure to China and perhaps the other emerging markets. So I think my advice is 
a variety of equity index funds which complement and round out each other and then leave it alone. You know, they, they, when, when, uh, when automation uh, began to make great inroads into employment as they did in the, uh, as it did in the, in the aughts and especially the teens, uh, they used to talk about the factory of the future. In the factory of the future, there's one man and one dog. The dog's job is to keep the man from touching the machinery. And the man's job is to feed the dog. It's the same with the grandchildren. My job is to, is to create a portfolio for them and keep them from putting their hands on it. Uh, and I think that that, that, I think that that is a formula which is sure to work in the long run. And anything you do in the short run to try to outthink the market is probably going to reduce your likelihood of achieving your long run, run goals. A big difference between the late 60s and now, it seems, is the, the IP involved. Um, because, you know, I'm seeing similarities now, especially with the, the FANG stocks and companies that are leading the S&P 500, that I start to worry about those who are big time indexers. And I'm wondering if you see similar risk. These companies seemingly have no top because it seems almost impossible to put a price on their IP. So do you look at you know, the fact that the S&P 500 is market weighted as a potential risk to a lot of retail investors? Yeah, great question. Very relevant question. Uh, you know, in every market cycle, we get to the point where people say, you know what, this thing, whatever it is, whether it's the Nifty 50, uh, 50 years ago, or, or uh, uh, internet 20 years ago, or, you know, uh, tulip bulbs several hundred years ago. They get to the point where they say, well, this is, this is now, it's, it's risen to the point where it's a sure thing. This, is, this can't, can't lose. Uh, why not? Well, for example, you look at the, at, the, at, the, at the tech or the fangs. They're in the S&P heavily. Every time a dollar flows into, say, an S&P index fund, or even an active manager who kind of secretly uh, closet indexes, money is going to flow into these names, predominantly, because they are so heavily weighted in the index, which means that money has to keep flowing in, which means that they have to keep doing better, which means that they'll never falter, which means that it, they're a sure thing. Well, there are no sure things, and there's, there's nothing that can't falter. My dad used to tell the story about the guy who was the uh, uh, habitual gambler, and every week he would go to the track and lose all his money. So one day he heard about a race with only one horse. So he went out to the track, and he put all his money down, and halfway around the track, the horse jumped over the fence and ran away. The point is, there are no sure things, and if you, this goes back to the Mark Twain, if you find something that you think is a sure thing and you bet disproportionately on it because it's a certainty and it turns out not to be a certainty, that's how you lose a lot of money. And um, so uh, you, can, you can construct this account for the fangs that I just described about how the money has to keep flowing into them and it's kind of self-perpetuating. And when I was little, we used to talk about perpetual motion machines, which is a, a machine that can run forever with no fuel because it generates its own energy. They've never come up with one yet. There was a cartoonist named Rube Goldberg who used to design those and we used to talk about Rube Goldberg devices. But the truth is there is no perpetual motion machine. There's nothing that goes on forever. And the, the way to lose a lot of money is to buy something on the presumption that it is a perpetual motion machine and then, and then have a reawakening. Um, I think that the, and you know, by the way, the, the magic is off some of the fangs this year. They're not necessarily having great years. Stock markets, s and is up 18%. Many of them are, are, are underperforming, and Andrew would say that one year doesn't matter. But, but um, the thing is, 
that I believe that if if the if the market goes like this, and you have some asset, be it a, let's say it's a fang, and it keeps going like this, if one asset outperforms the others long enough, you have to flip it over. The the if you flip over outperform, what you find underneath is becoming more expensive. That's what outperformance is. So if if asset A outperforms B, which is to say does appreciates more than B long enough, disproportionate to the merits, eventually it will become overpriced. And if it's overpriced, it is it it is then likely to run into some hiccups and 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 a correction. So I just don't think that one asset can outperform all the others forever. And and investors who hear that siren song of of uh, permanent outperformance are in trouble if they succumb. I want to touch on corporate debt as you did earlier, because it seems like that game is shifting a little bit as well. The Fed now holds nearly fourteen billion in corporate bonds themselves. How does the Fed's recent involvement into these markets affect your personal, you know, or Oak Tree's rather investing playbook? Um, the most important thing about that, uh, Trey, is what it did in the recent past. You know, we were we were expecting something, uh, 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 you know, a massive recession, something approaching a global depression if the central banks hadn't come to the rescue. And uh, in the first half of uh, 2020, we raised a the largest fund in history for distressed debt investing, uh, $15 billion. Uh, the previous record was our 08 fund, which was $11 billion. And we were you know, we started to invest that uh, that money and and uh, and so forth, and and in March and April there were great great bargains to be had. Then uh, the the Fed came in, cutting interest rates, giving out grants and loans, and uh, starting to buy some corporate debt, which they had never done before. The Fed had never bought corporate debt before, and the main effect of that was that it precluded the kind of meltdown that we had expected to occur and that we had expected to take advantage of. Uh, but that's in the past now. Um, and uh, they got, there were, there were lots of companies that would not have gotten through uh, the pandemic uh, in one piece, but they got through because the Fed kept loading them up with money, making more money available to them and, and, and buying their bonds. Uh, anyway, um, you know, we're value investors. I don't know if the Fed's going to keep buying. By the way, it, it, the fourteen billion they bought is something, but it's not a huge amount of money bond mar- in bond market terms. And you know, I assume they're 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 probably done buying corporate bonds now. It's it's a very radical thing for the Fed to do, and they've probably done all they want to do for a while. Um, but um, you know, we kind of, like you, you said that one of the tenets of Oak Tree's investment philosophy is we don't let market uh, macro forecasts influence our investment decision. We don't say, well, let's see, should we buy that bond? Will the Fed be buying that bond uh, on Thursday or not? You know, that kind of thing. Or will they be cutting interest rates or raising it? We just look at, we, we look at, a, at, at an asset. We say we think we can get a return of X percent under normal circumstances, and we think that X percent is a good return given the level of risk in that company. And so we make that decision kind of on an internal basis. The company, the risks, and the possible return without making guesses about what's going to happen in the environment. It's just too damn hard to get, to get that, in, that environment part right. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed. 
don't forget to hit the like button and to subscribe if you haven't done it already